Good morning. Welcome to Thursday of Holy Week. It is good to be together with all of you this morning as we gather once again around the cross. Hear this uh, welcome and greeting. Would you join me responsively in our call to worship? Lent calls us to faithful living, to trust the one who gives us life. Let us pray. O oh God, by the example of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, you taught us the greatness of true humility and call us to watch with him in his passion. Give us grace to serve one another in all lowliness and to enter into the fellowship of his suffering. In his name and for his sake we pray, as we pray together now the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand as you are able? We're going to sing the first three verses of the hymn, Were You There? Number may be seated. We continue with our scripture this morning. We've been reading through the Gospel of John uh, this week and spending time uh, thinking about the passion those last 24 hours before Jesus' crucifixion, as it is um, told in the Gospel of John. And, and these are in chapters 18 and 19 of John. Today, we continue our reading by picking up with uh, Pilate, continuing to interact and have his conversation with Jesus um, and Pilate's interactions with the crowds that lead um, to Jesus being sentenced to death. 
Hear now these words and listen for the word of God for you. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And after he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a, was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Here is the man. And when the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no case against him. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, we ought, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again, and, and he asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon, and he said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over then he, to them to be crucified. This is the word of God for the people of God. We continue in worship with our ministry of music, Love Carried the Cross.
and promise of life beyond that moment. So he took the cross of death willingly. Though I was a child when I heard it, how oh, Jesus took the wrath of man shame but when I saw my sins were the nails he felt at Calvary it was there I knew I'd never be the same oh, oh, oh. so much for that offering this morning and those words and reminder. Today we hear about Jesus sentenced to death and our speaker is Michelle Williams. Michelle serves currently as the chair of our leadership council. She is in the Pathways Sunday School class and has taught many of our Grow Adult offerings here at CUMC. She has a passion for teaching and leading. She's working on becoming a certified lay minister in our annual conference, which is some leadership classes and opportunities to lead better in local congregations. And so I invite you on to join me in inviting Michelle and welcoming her this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can't ask, can't ask me if this was my debut, and that is true. In this capacity and in this church, I, I thank you for the opportunity to share God's message today. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, as we gather in this sacred space, we humbly seek your presence and guidance. Pour out your spirit upon us as your word is shared. Grant us clarity of thought and understanding that we may hear your truths of love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. In today's scripture, that was so eloquently said by Pastor Jake, Pilate presented Jesus to the crowd and deemed he found no basis for charges. With Pilate giving the crowd a choice who to release, Jesus or Barabbas, the crowd demanded Barabbas. Then Pilate ordered Jesus flogged. The soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and placed it on his head. While mocking him, they wrapped him in a purple robe and slapped him in the face. Pilate again brought Jesus out to the crowd, claiming he found Jesus did nothing wrong. The Jewish leaders demanded crucifixion. Pilate went back and forth, claiming there was no basis for him to charge Jesus and tried to set him free. Yet the Jewish leaders threatened him and demanded Jesus' crucifixion. Pilate brought Jesus out to the crowd again, but the crowd demanded he be crucified. Pilate gave up and handed Jesus over to the soldiers. Do we know who was in the crowd? Were the disciples there? Peter had been in the courtyard and denied Jesus three times. Could the other disciples have been 
nearby, hearing the shouts of Jesus' crucifixion. And what about Mary, Jesus' mother? Was she a witness in the crowd outside Pilate's palace, or was she with the disciples in hiding? We can't know for sure. Jesus shared with the disciples what would take place after he arrived in Jerusalem. I imagine his forewarning did not ease their anguish, hopelessness, and fear. Fear for him and for themselves. Did he help prepare his mother for these events as well? Did she feel comforted by Jesus' words of assurance of fulfilling God's will and purpose? Did she struggle with the heaviness of what lay ahead? Mary certainly saw the outcome of Jesus' torture and beating the day of his crucifixion. She was there. She saw the blood and injuries that would have been obvious as he carried the cross through the streets. She would have seen the wounds of the soldiers' mockery and flogging even before he was nailed to the cross. We don't know for sure how much Mary knew of the details where she was during his arrest and sentencing. But as Jesus' mother, did she know of the pain that she would endure watching her son go through hatred, torture, crucifixion, and death? We find some understanding in Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. The scriptures introduce us to Simeon a devout and holy man visited by the Holy Spirit and promised that he would see the Lord's Messiah before he died. Just after Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph brought the infant to the temple for dedication. The Holy Spirit led Simeon to the temple that day. When Simeon saw Jesus, he took the baby in his arms and praised God declaring that he had now seen the salvation God had promised the world. Simeon blessed Mary and Joseph, and then turning to Mary said, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul Two. Simeon declared what she would experience, a soul piercing. It suggests the pain and sorrow that Mary, the mother of Jesus, would experience in her life. It tells of the deep emotional suffering and heartache that Mary would endure as she witnessed the events surrounding her son's life and death and the anguish she would feel particularly during Jesus' crucifixion. I imagine Jesus and Mary had deep and intimate conversations that were only between a mother and a son. She knew from the beginning what was to come and how much it would hurt, yet she endured. In times of grief and despair, she surely counted on hope, on God's promise and assurance of love, As she may have remembered the prophecy of Simeon, so too Jesus would have given her words of assurance, his promise of redemption and salvation, and the knowledge of fulfilling God's plan. At his crucifixion, she was there at the foot of the cross. I imagine her faith stood strong and unwavering, yet she likely experienced waves of grief and anguish. As he hung on the cross, Jesus gave the disciple John as her son, and her as John's mother. Mary had the support of her community and Mary Magdalene, the women, and the disciples. Jesus offered peace with his words, as we see in John 16, verse 33, when he spoke to the disciples about the upcoming events of his arrest and crucifixion. I have told you these things so that you so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Mary reminds us that even in our darkest moments, God's love and promises remain. 
In our lives, there are times we experience what Mary must have felt. We have heard the news from someone we love that they have a terminal illness. We walk beside those who struggle with mental health, anxiety, depression, addiction, or an abusive relationship. We live through tragic losses, the death of a beloved family member, a brother, an aunt, grandparents, even a child and a grandchild. We grapple with profound sadness, guilt, and regret. In these moments of hopelessness and helplessness, we may question God's love and our own faith. I have questioned it, and that's okay. Reflecting on these past tragedies and trials, all of which I've experienced. I realize Jesus has been with me every step of the way. Jesus understood and understands our suffering. Staying by our side then and now, through prayer and reflection, I've leaned on his promises of reassurance and hope. In his presence, I've discovered the strength to endure, knowing that I am not alone in my pain. Jesus' love and grace provide a refuge during life's storms. Jesus offers us support and comfort, even in the darkest moments when hope seems lost. Jesus invites each of us to connect with our own trials, sorrows, and traumas, knowing that he offers the same relief and hope to all who seek him. We read the words of Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times in 1 Peter verse, chapter 5, verses 7 and 10, casting our anxieties on Jesus, who cares for us deeply, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And who knows better than Peter? Mary knew that she would endure what she would endure and what her son was born to do, to be the Messiah, the salvation of the world, God in flesh, crucified, dead, and buried, and on the third day would rise again. She had a community to support her, words to comfort her, and an understanding of God's broader plan. She knew from the beginning her soul would be pierced. Then, through her son, her soul would be saved and restored. Jesus invites us all to build a strong faith and intimacy with him, connect with community, and remember the resurrection regardless of what we're going through. As we embrace the path ahead, Jesus offers an open door to a journey with him at our side. In a relationship that offers peace, understanding, and love, not just in moments of joy, but also through every trial we face. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants to hear our deepest fears, our joys, and our sorrows. He invites us into a personal conversation to share our thoughts, our feelings, and our experiences. This is the most intimate of prayers, and Jesus will meet us right where we are. Jesus wants us to recognize the importance of community. As he entrusted his mother Mary to John and the connection that Mary had with the women and the disciples, let us connect with community, share our life experiences, and grow together in our faith. Encourage and pray for each other and foster a sense of belonging and mutual support. Easter is not just a time to reflect on Jesus' suffering and death, but also to celebrate his resurrection and the hope that it brings. 
Keep the hope of Jesus' resurrection and the promise of eternal life in the forefront. And let this hope guide us through challenges and inspire us to share the good news. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the words of your son, for the gift of your son, for the blessing of community, and for the resurrection and salvation that you granted us all. And we ask that you be with each of us as we move forward in the Easter journey and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray, amen. Thank you, Michelle, for those words and those reminders of the love of Christ that is with us no matter what. I invite you now as you're able to stand and let us sing together what wondrous love is this, hymn number 292. invite you to be seated. After our prayer, there'll be moments of silence, an opportunity for you to reflect on the message and to share with God what's on your heart this morning. And when the postlude begins, you're welcome to leave as you are ready. We ask that this space remain a space of quiet and reflection as long as someone is in here this morning. Also a reminder that this evening at 7 p.m. we'll have our Monday Thursday service here in the worship center. Our confirmands are going to help with leading that service, and it's an opportunity for us to remember that wondrous love of Christ. Tonight we'll celebrate communion together, and we'll be reminded of the ways in which we are called to love like Jesus from the perspective of our young teenagers. And so we give thanks and invite you to join us this evening, whether in person or online, whatever works for you. I invite you now to bow your heads and let's pray. Oh Lord, we give thanks 
for this morning's worship, for the time to be reminded of those who were in the crowd, of those who watched the sentencing of Jesus, of the emotions of his mother and his disciples and those who were beside him, and for the ways in which Jesus went through and did what was necessary, what was his calling, so that we may have life eternal. What wondrous love is this? We give thanks for the love of Christ that has been on display this whole week and will continue to be shown to us and for us. Lord, may his love dwell in our hearts. And may we take that out and share it with those we meet today. For Lord, our community, our world, and many that we will meet are broken, are suffering, and are in need of the love of Christ that alone can bring healing and peace. We give thanks for this time together for the reminder of these words and for the opportunity and the blessing to go and to break bread together and to share in a meal. May you bless the food that we will eat, the many hands that have prepared it, and bless us to go and be your love this day. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen.